Hi, I'm Ned Kalange. I'm the President and CEO of the Colorado Trust. We believe that all Coloradans should have fair and equal opportunities to live healthy, productive lives regardless of race, ethnicity, income, where we live, or the other differences that affect opportunity. I have to admit to you that I woke up this morning full of hope. It's my hope born of the belief that we're a people who are at our best in facing challenges when the challenges are the greatest. It's hope fueled by a heightened sense of urgency for us working in this vitally critical space of health equity. I know there have been tragic events over the past couple of years that have challenged and threatened us. And now at the election, I know there's great uncertainty about the future. While I know that uncertainty brings new challenges and formidable obstacles, I also believe where there's uncertainty, there are opportunities. We must take opportunity to recommit and redouble our efforts to address the inequities in our communities. How we move forward from yesterday depends on how we show up, how we do our work. The Colorado Trust is undaunted, unwavering, adamant about pursuing our work in health equity. And I'm really turning to you, our colleagues and partners, to join us. I'm inspired. I mean, how can you not sit in this room and not be inspired by the people around you? I'm inspired by those in other communities who will watch today's presentation and use it to, to uh, dialogue in their communities about issues around health equity and race. I believe our strength as a country is rooted in our diversity. I believe that our unity comes from our ability to embrace across difference. Today, we have to accept the responsibility of helping our nation heal, helping our nation come together, and realizing the promise of equity and health for all. Now, I'm proud and I'm humbled to be here with such a strong ally in our work to advance health equity. A short time ago, Dr. Rachel Hardiman co-wrote a piece for the New England Medical Journal that linked police-related shootings to structural racism, which Dr. Hardiman called the common denominator of the violence that is cutting lives short in the United States. This piece provides a remarkable overview of how structural racism impacts health, not just for communities of color, but for our entire society. We'll post a link to the article on our Health <coughs> Equity Learning Series website in the next day or two, and I hope you'll take the advantage to read it. It gives me hope to know that people like Dr. Hardiman are actively working to address structural racism and other important issues and spreading the health equity message in the medical com community and beyond. Before I turn things over to Dr. Hardiman, just a few notes. We'll email you an evaluation survey after today's presentation. Please keep an eye out for it and complete it. We honestly do read every evaluation and use it to plan our work going forward. Materials will be posted on the website after the presentation today, including the slide deck that Dr. Hardiman will use, the article I mentioned, and in another couple of weeks, a complete video of today's event. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the 20 grantees for the 2016-2017 Health Equity Learning Series who are listed on the screen. These organizations are hosting community viewings of today's event across Colorado. The viewings will be accompanied by professionally facilitated discussions, and if you'd like to participate or find a viewing event near you, please visit our Health Equity Learning Series web, uh, webpage and you'll see links to all of our grantees' websites and their schedules. These will be taking place in the state in the next few weeks. So now I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Rachel Hardiman. She is a health inequities researcher whose work focuses on the provider contribution to equity and quality of healthcare delivery and the ways in which race can impact healthcare. 
She has focused extensively on prenatal care delivery and persistent disparate birth outcomes for African American women. She's also a leading expert in medical education research, focusing on the experiences of underrepresented minority physician trainees and how physicians can be trained and are trained to provide equitable and bias-free care. She holds her doctorate in health services, research policy and administration, and a master's of public health, both from the University, I'm sorry, the Minnesota, University of Minnesota School of Public Health. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Hardiman. Good morning, everyone, or almost good afternoon. Um, I'm really, really happy to be here and have had a great experience learning more about the Colorado Trust and um, the work that um, is happening here in, Colo in Denver and in Colorado, Colorado around health inequities. I'm also really excited to have a family member in the audience, um, my cousin Laura and, um, and a colleague of mine, a former colleague from Minnesota, Megan. Um, I certainly feel um, like I'm among, among family and that was apparent at dinner last night as well um, with folks from the trust. Um, I want to start by acknowledging the new kind of political climate that we have uh, found ourselves in. And, you know, as a black mother, as a black academic, um, as a black woman and a member of the black community, I spent yesterday in mourning, um, as I'm sure many of you um, have as well. You know, for me, the decisions our, country's made, uh, our country made on Tuesday um, are not simply about who's going to run the country for the next four years, but the fact that I walk among, work among, send my three-year-old to preschool among um, people who are willing to offer a racist, a sexist, and a misogynistic person the chance to make decisions about our communities, about my family, about my daughter, and our livelihood. While I wasn't necessarily the hugest um, supporter of, of Hillary Clinton, I knew she was our best chance. Um, she was my best chance at being able to look my daughter in the eye and tell her that the work that I do when I get up in the morning and the work that I do when, I, when she goes to bed at night and I open my laptop and I keep writing and I keep researching, um, that it matters. And like Ned said, he, he, he's feeling more hopeful today. I'm still getting there, I'm working on it. Um, and I think putting this, this presentation together and talking to you all today is helping me towards that point, and I hope it will help you all as well. Um, you know, but I do have to say that pr pr prior to November 8th, I could see and envision a world where one day my daughter could be president, um, as she so confidently declared that she would be when we went to vote. Um, last week. Um, she told me she was going to be both President and Princess Anna. She's obsessed with Frozen right now. Um, and so, so I say this to say that usually when I give talks like this around racism and health inequities, I do so with a lot of hope and a lot of belief in the greater good and the fact that we can make change and that we're you know, slowly making our way towards that. And so I just want to put it out there that I don't have as much of that today, and I hope you all will bear with me. Um, and I, I, think, I think I'll get there again. I think we all will get there again. Um, and it's a long process, and it's an important one, and I think this conversation is an important piece of that. Um, now more than ever, we have so much work to do, and I'm so happy that you all are here to um, continue the conversation and to continue that work. So I want to start, oops, there we go. So I want to start um, by sharing with you an article that was published in the New York Times actually before November 8th, and it was written by um, African-American activist and, um, and actor Harry Belafonte. And he said, he started out by saying, what old men know is that everything can change. And it's a really, really kind of um, disturbing, uh, he had some very important force, uh, foresight around kind of what, what might happen and what could possibly happen and what has now um, happened and what we're faced with. But um, he also uses uh, Langston Hughes' poem, um, America be, Let America Be America Again, to kind of describe our history and where we've been and where we are now and the potential pitfalls of where we can end up. And so I just want to share a little bit of what he wrote, kind of to set the stage for the conversation that I hope that we can have today. So he says, 
It was an America where the life of a black person didn't count for much, where women were still second-class citizens, where Jews and other ethnic whites were looked on with suspicion, and immigrants were kept out almost completely unless they came from certain approved countries in Northern Europe, where gay people dared not speak the name of their love, and were passing as white, as a wasp, as a heterosexual, as something, anything else, that fit in with what America was supposed to be, was commonplace with all of the self-abasement and the shame that it, that, that it entailed. It was an America rule, still ruled at its base by violence, where lynchings, and especially the threat of lynchings, were used to keep minorities away from the ballot box and in their place, where companies amassed arsenals of weapons for goons to use against their own employees and recruited the police and National Guardsmen to help them. These private corporate armies proved insufficient where destitute veterans of World War I were driven from the streets of Washington with tear gas and bayonets after they went to our nation's capital to ask for the money they were owed. Much of that was how America had always been, and we changed it, many of us, through some of the proudest struggles of our history. It wasn't easy, and sometimes it wasn't pretty, but we did it together. We won voting rights for all, we ended Jim Crow and we pushed open the golden door again to welcome immigrants. We achieved full rights for women and fought to let people of all genders and sexual orientations stand in the light. And if we have not yet created the America that Langston Hughes swore will be, the land that never has been yet, if there is still much to be done, at least we have advanced our standards of humanity, hope, and decency to places where many people never thought we could reach. He goes on to say, but what old men know too is that all that, all that is gained can be lost. This phrase hasn't stopped resonating in my head over the past couple of days. And I think that in order to minimize our losses in the world of health inequities and in the world writ large, there's a lot we need to understand and a lot of work we need to do. And so with that, I would like to start um, by talking about a subject that I don't often bring into my discussions around racism and health, but I think given um, the, the, what's occurred over the past couple days, it's, important, it's an important place to start. And that's with white supremacy. White supremacy is what's changed our political climate overnight, and we need to understand what it is, what it looks like, and if we're going to have any more forward traction in eliminating health inequities and health disparities, we need to be able to define it, we need to be able to say the words, and we need to be able to accept it as part of what has created the inequities in our society. So white supremacy is a historically based, institutionally perpetuated system of exploitation and oppression of continents, nations, and peoples of color by white peoples and nations of the European continent for the purpose of maintaining and defending a system of wealth, power, and privilege. It also can be described as a political ideology that perpetuates and maintains a social, political, historical, and or industrial domination by white people as evidenced by the historical and contemporary socio-political structures such as the Atlantic slave trade, Jim Crow laws, and the US and apartheid in South Africa. White supremacy is at the root of structural racism and the persistent health inequities, but we don't often talk about that piece of it when we talk about health inequities and health disparities. And I really think that we need to move our conversation in that way to be able to really dismantle the systems that have created um, these persistent inequities that we're seeing in our communities. White supremacy is what has allowed black men to be shot and killed by police officers with little or no recourse. And it's my hope that those of us that are doing this important work can begin to use that phrase and use that language and get comfortable with it. Um, as, hard as, that is, as hard as that is, we have to get comfortable with the language that we're using and really say what we mean and mean what we say. Issues of race and white supremacy and structural racism have been at the forefront of our news and media, and certainly during this election cycle, um, but they were particularly highlighted in the media going back to when um, George Zimmerman shot and uh, killed Trayvon Martin. 
We've seen headlines discussing America's race problem, and we've really been forced to grapple with, or at least have been unable to turn away from the fact that race is deeply embedded in our society um, as Americans. And the Black Lives Matter movement in particular has highlighted the insidious impact of structural racism on the health and well-being of black, um, black communities as well as other marginalized communities. So I know it's a lot. I know it's, it's a lot to process. It's a lot to handle and understand. And it's complex and it's disturbing. I do want to mention that when I talk about structural racism and white supremacy, I'm not talking about individual um, perpetrators. I'm not talking about individual racists. That's not what this discussion is about. It's about the systems. It's about the structures that, um, that are in place and the ideologies that have allocated privilege based on race for many, many years. And the fact that if we don't understand and recognize it, then we're playing a role in perpetuating it. So now I want to take a step back and talk about race as a social construct. I think it's an important piece of, um, of understanding why health inequities exist and understanding what we can do to um, eliminate them. So the idea of race emerged as a justification for new world slavery in the 17th century and legitimized a social hierarchy that privileged whites. At first, enslaved Africans received treatment only marginally different from that that was for, afforded other members of lower ranks. In the second half of the uh, 17th century, uh, slave laws were passed to secure the labor force for plantations and to prevent coalitions from, or between black slaves and white indentured servants. Status differentials between blacks and whites solidified and indentured servants from a variety of European nations began to see themselves as, white, as a white race um, for the first time. Racial beliefs have always been tied to social ideas and policy. After all, if differences between groups are natural, then nothing can or should be done to correct for unequal outcomes. The scientific literature in the late 19th and 20th centuries explicitly championed this view, and many prominent scientists uh, devoted countless hours to documenting racial differences and promoting man's natural hierarchy. Although today many of those ideas are outmoded, it's still popular to believe in innate racial traits rather than look elsewhere to explain group differences. Uh, we all know the myths and the stereotypes that natural black athletic, of natural black athletic superiority, musical ability among Asians, but we really need to continue to ask ourselves, are these, are these really true on a biological level? And if not, why do we believe them? You know, there was an example um, that came out, a study that came out in 2015 from the University of Virginia that found that 50%, 50 percent, so half of medical students and residents at the school endorsed beliefs around race being biological. So these students would answer questions such um, as true, such as um, black people's blood coagulates more quickly or black people have a higher tolerance to pain. And one of the other findings from this work was that people who were more likely to endorse those types of beliefs were also more likely to hold implicit racial bias. <laughs> Um, so we have a lot of work to do to debunk a lot of the myths and understand that race is a social construct. And from this, um, we've created the, what we call today racism. So a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how one looks, which is what we call race. So structural racism, then, is a confluence of institutions, culture, history, ideology, and codified practices that generate and perpetuate inequity among racial groups. Structural racism is often normative. It's sometimes legalized. And it often manifests as inherited disadvantage. And a lot of times, it's very insidious. We don't even um, acutely, we aren't always acutely aware that it's even operating. So I think it's always important to have the discussion about health inequities and health disparities within this construct of structural racism by distinguishing the difference between inequities and disparities. I think for a long time in the field of public health, we've talked about health disparities. Um, and we, or we use the two, disparities and inequities, interchangeably. And it's important that we, um, again, you know, th are thoughtful about the language we use. So a health inequity is a difference in health that's a result of systemic, avoidable and unjust so social and economic policies and practices 
that create barriers to opportunity. So it's those avoidable and unjust differences that are linked to systems and structures. Disparities, on the other hand, are the differences in incidence, prevalence, mortality, and burden of disease, and other adverse health conditions that exist among specific population groups in the, in the US. And that's the definition that the National Institute of Health uses. So for years, researchers have asked, is there a difference in health status rates between population groups based on a variety of different health outcomes, failing to link that to the systems and structures that have created those differences. So again, the language we use is important. You know, as I said, we've been stuck on disparities for decades without cultivating our understanding of inequities. Inequities cause disparities. Structural racism causes inequities. Um, while disparities are very real, those differences are very real and undeniable, but they're also a very real distraction in my mind from the, the issue at hand, which is structural racism. So now I'd like to share with you a few examples of um, the link between structural racism and health inequities, just so we kind of understand how this is operating and the different ways that it can create um, those inequities in health. I'm sure you all have heard a ton about the Flint, Michigan water crisis, and I think it's an important, it's a, it's, it's a casebook study of how structu structural racism has impacted health. Um, Flint is a city that's almost 60% African American, it's incredibly poor, and since 2014, they've been drinking and bathing in water that contains enough lead to meet the Environmental Protection Agency's definition of toxic waste. And the most recent report on Flint found that, or stated, Flint residents who are majority black or African American and among the most impoverished of any metropolitan area in the United States did not enjoy the same degree of protection from environmental and health hazards as they provided to other communities. And this is a perfect example of where there's no single person to shoulder the blame for the situation. But thanks to widespread mismanagement um, of a largely black and brown community, they now face the disproportionate effects of systemic neglect. And to many, Flint's water crisis fits into a historical trend of environmental racism in the US, which for decades has allowed polluters to prey on communities of color and low-income communities, um, and in part due to weak environmental regulations. Food accessibility is another important example that we need to consider. I'm sure many of you are doing work around, um, you know, what I think that the phrase now is food deserts. So decisions made on a purely economic grounds can produce racial disparities. So when grocery store chains decide not to locate a store in a poorer neighborhood, so when's the last time you saw Whole Foods prop, uh, you know, uh, building a store in a low income or a black or other marginalized community? Um, this contributes to neighborhood and food environments that have very little access to healthy and fresh foods, or the foods they do have access to are very expensive. And there's a strong link between that and higher risks of obesity, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. We also know that there's links between residential segregation and the seemingly neutral policies of financing public schools primarily through local property, um, private property taxes. So this is linked to poor health outcomes in many ways. There's studies that have shown a link between cardiovascular health and just the idea that certain communities are building wealth and accumulating wealth in ways that a lot of other um, low-income or black communities are not able to do. And that's linked directly to housing policies and redlining as well and the, the use of race and ethnicity to determine mortgage eligibility in communities. Um, one of, there's been studies that have looked at, for instance, elevated blood, level, blood lead levels um, as a result of a higher likelihood of living in older housing that's contaminated with lead-based paint. And um, African-American communities are disproportionately impacted in that way. So now I'd like to share a few examples from um, the world that I work in, which is uh, prenatal care and birth outcomes. So we know that birth outcomes, um, the, the inequities in birth outcomes are persistent. Um, we have not made much headway in, in closing that gap. Um, over the years, we've seen an improvement overall, if you look at the general population, um, in birth, uh, birth outcomes, but when you start to look at things by race and by socioeconomic status, those numbers haven't moved. Uh, Minnesota is a perfect example of the fact that we're consistently ranked as one of the healthiest uh, states in, in the nation, 
Um, and we have some of the best birth outcomes in the nation, but when you start to look underneath the surface, African American and American Indian babies in particular are twice as likely to die in the first year of, of life um, in comparison to white babies. And Mar the March of Dimes actually just um, produced a report around preterm birth and graded all of the states. And there's a lot of states who got an A or a B when it came to birth outcomes overall, generally speaking, within their populations. And then those grades fell to a C or a D when you started looking at the differences by, by race and by um, socioeconomic status. So we know there's persistent inequities and disparities in um, birth outcomes, so low birth weight, um, babies that are less than five or five and a half pounds at birth, uh, preterm birth, so babies that are born before 37 weeks gestation, infant mortality, and mat maternal mortality as well. So um, New York in particular has some of the highest um, disparity, or the worst disparities in um, maternal mortality um, in the US. So some of the work that's been done around this, um, so I should back up for a second to say that there's a lot of work that's shown that everyday discrimination, so women and families walking through life and experiencing kind of the interpersonal um, encounters of discrimination, that that can impact birth outcomes because we know that stress is bad, for, um, you know, bad during pregnancy and all of the kind of physiological stuff that, go, that comes with that. But there's less that's looked at actually how structure, structural racism and systems um, have impacted birth outcomes. And so that's where I'm spending a lot of uh, the time with my, my work right now. But a recent study did find that the joint effects of structural racism and income inequality on small for gestational age birth um, is associated with, so structural racism indicators are associated with higher odds of small for gestational age birth. And what they looked at were um, state level indicators like um, employment, um, incarceration, education levels, so having a bachelor's degree or not, and then use state level coefficients to kind of assess income inequality as well. And the second study I think is really fascinating. Um, it was published actually in 2013 by a social epidemiologist, Nancy Krieger at Harvard, and she looked at Jim Crow laws. So actually looking at legal discrimination, a perfect example, right, of structural racism, and, and um, looked at the association with infant mortality rates and found that there was a beneficial effect at the end of Jim Crow laws um, on the reduction of premature uh, mortality for black infants. So while there's little that's looked at structural racism in birth outcomes, there's even less that's actually kind of measured or figured out interventions or thought about ways to disrupt this pathway between structural racism and, and adverse birth outcomes. Um, one study that was recently published, um, actually a couple months ago, I think is really, really important work that needs to be explored further. And um, it was published in Amer the American Journal of Public Health, if anyone's interested in taking a look. But what they found was that the effect um, that if all states in 2014 had increased their minimum wage by $1, so just $1 increase, there would have likely been almost 3,000 fewer low birth weight births and 518 fewer post-neonatal deaths for the year. And I think that's a great example of the ways that policy can impact health. And we don't always see the direct, um, kind of the, the, du the direct impact there, but, um, more work in that, in that area, I think will start to help that unfold a little more. I'm also really excited to share a, an intervention that I'm working on that's been recently been funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. So we are partnering, um, we meaning the University of Minnesota, are partnering with Roots Birth Center. It's a community birth center in North Minneapolis. North Minneapolis is a community in Minnesota that has some of the worst, well, the worst um, inequities in birth outcomes in our state. Um, it has a very high population of um, African American population and is also um, low income. And Roots Birth Center is one of five black owned birth centers in the US, one of five, and the only one in Minnesota. And the midwife there, her name is Rebecca Polston, and she is providing um, what she calls culturally centered or culturally focused care. And she's seeing, she, they've been open for a year, and she's seeing amazing outcomes. She's seeing um, less, actually she hasn't had any preterm births. Um, she hasn't had any low birth weight babies. Um, but she hasn't had a mechanism yet to be able to document the work that she's doing. And so that's what we're really excited to be able to do. And in some of the conversations that we've had with her and with her staff, um, 
you know, she talks about how they are working to disrupt that pathway between structural racism and birth outcomes, how they're having conversations with the families, how they talk about the fact that it's painful for a black woman to be, know that she is bringing an, a, black, a black boy into this world, um, given that um, Jamar Clark was, was shot and killed less than a mile from where the birth center sits. Um, and so those are the types of kind of, of interventions that I think are really important to consider as we're, we're doing this work and really important to be able to have those conversations around um, how, how racism is impacting the day-to-day -day lives of, um, of the people that we're, we're helping and working with. So, okay. Um, before I shift to talking about what we can do and what our role is in dismantling these systems, um, I wanted to bring up one more thing that I think is important for, for us to think about and to talk about a little bit, and that's um, intersectionality, which is a term that many of you have probably heard quite a bit throughout the election season. Um, and it's, it's a theoretical notion that originated by um, Kimberly Crenshaw in the early 90s, I believe. Um, and was revisited recently in her work. Um, she actually wrote an essay that was published in the Washington Post uh, entitled Why, Inter Why Intersectionality Can't Wait. And in that essay, she makes the case for using intersectionality as a framework for analyzing racial, sexual, and economic justice, um, the very issues that were at the forefront of the presidential election this year. And um, she also states that intersectionality was a lived reality before it became a term. So in my mind, it's this analytic sensibility. It's a way of thinking about identity and its relationship to power. So when I do work on prenatal care and birth outcomes, I'm thinking about the intersections of race and the intersections of gendered and um, what we uh, sometimes refer to as gendered racism. Um, it's also, it's given, it, it allows advocates um, a way to frame their circumstances and to fight for, the visi for visibility and inclusion. And I think it's really important to think about the fact that so today I'm talking about structural racism and really focus my work on um, the black community, but there's so many intersections there that we need to consider. So whether you're living in a rural area and what does that mean for kind of how, what your experience is, is, is as an African American person or um, girls of color in the fight against the school to prison pipeline, women within the immigration movement, trans women within feminist movements, um, people with disabilities um, fighting police abuse. So we all face vulnerabilities that reflect these intersections of racism, of sexism, of class oppression, transphobia, ableism, and more. And if we're not thoughtful about those intersections of all these identities and how they um, are related to power and privilege, we're not doing our job fully. So I want to switch gears before we kind of wrap up and have a discussion to talk a little bit about our collective responsibility um, for supporting black lives and, and dismantling racism. So Ned mentioned the article that we published recently in the New England Journal of Medicine called Structural Racism in Supporting Black Lives, the Role of Health Professionals. And we wrote this, so it was, it was co-authored um, by actually my, my husband, who's a family medicine physician, and my colleague, um, Katie Casamano, who's a health policy researcher. Um, we, we wrote this in July, after Philando Castile was shot and killed by police about a mile and a half from the University of Minnesota, where we work. And we were all very feeling very helpless and feeling very sad. And, um, and needed, needed to channel that in some way that could be useful and could um, facilitate a discussion among our colleagues who seemingly um, didn't seem to be as affected by it as we were. Um, you know, I was sitting in my office and feeling like I had no one to, to cry with and no one to talk to about these, these things. And um, so this was one way of being able to, to do that and to start this conversation. And I will also say that I think what we wrote is not brand new information. 
Um, you know, we stand on the backs of many critical race theory scholars, um, W.E.B. Uh, w. E. Du Bois and others who have been talking about, and, and also, you know, people in the Black Lives Matter movement who've been talking about this stuff for a very, very long time. And we, our goal was really to package it for healthcare professionals and um, so clinicians and researchers in a way that was, um, they were able to understand it and to really take it to heart and to put it into practice. And so I'm going to share with you kind of the five things that we talk about in this piece. Um, and while I recognize that not everyone in the room is a healthcare professional, I think that um, it's relevant for all of us, especially now more than ever, as we move through this world and we encounter people who um, may not have the same um, belief system and values as us. It's, a, it's an important way and an important tool to be able to um, facilitate discussions and hopefully to come to some kind of understanding. See, I'm already becoming more optimistic. <laughs> so the first thing we say is that we need to learn about, understand, and accept the United States racist roots. And that's why I started um, by talking about white supremacy and the, the social construction of race and what that means. If we don't understand that, then we can't understand why the structures and systems are in place that have created health inequities. Um, structural racism is born of a doctrine of white supremacy that was developed to justify mass oppression involving economic and political exploitation. So that's a direct quote from the article, and we were really excited to um, see that the New England Journal of Medicine published the phrase white supremacy. I don't think they've ever done that before. Um, and again, I think it's an important part of moving this conversation uh, forward. So, you know, part of that is understanding the, the history of experimentation on black communities, um, understanding segregation of care based on race and that history and why there's mistrust um, among a lot of black communities when accessing the healthcare system. Um, disparate health outcomes and systematic inequalities in terms of wealth, well-being, and quality of life must be seen as extensions of the historical context in which black lives have been devalued. We also, oops, sorry about that. So we also um, talk about the fact that we need to understand how racism has shaped our narrative about disparities. And that's why I always try to make the link between structural racism and health inequities and health disparities. Um, we need to understand why disparities exist and not talk about just those differences. Um, we also need to recognize that implicit biases and false beliefs are common. We all have them, um, but if we can't, and that's, and while that's, you know, that's, that's our reality, we have to be able to recognize that. Um, and we have to be able to challenge them within ourselves and also within one another. Um, we also need to define and name racism. So consistent definitions and accurate vocabulary for measuring, for studying, and discussing race and racism and their relationships to health. Particularly um, as a health services researcher, you know, we, we put race in models in, in our regression models and our analytical models all the time without giving any thought to what it means and without giving any thought to the fact that there's a processes, there's racism that is behind what race means in those findings. Um, and the same happens in clinical and clinical medicine as well. When medical students are taught to present a case by saying, you know, so-and-so is a 60-year-old African-American male. So what does that mean? Why is that relevant for how you're presenting the case? So if we acknowledge and name racism in our work, our writing, our research, and interactions, we can advance understanding of the distinction between uh, racial categorization and racism and clear the way for efforts to combat the latter. Um, I also would say, you know, as I, I kind of started out this talk by saying, this requires all of us to name racism, um, to name structural racism, to name white supremacy, and also ask the question in all of our interactions and all of what we're, you know, even if we're sitting in our workplaces looking at our strategic plan, asking how is racism operating here? Because I think we would be surprised at the answer um, in a lot of those cases. Uh, recognize racism, not just race. So black Americans on average have more poorly controlled diabetes and higher rates of diabetes, diabetes complications than white Americans. So going back to my example of the link between structural racism and food accessibility, um, you know, 
being able to recognize that the reason that poorly controlled um, and higher prevalence of diabetes may be linked to policies around food, uh, food accessibility and the, and the decisions of, um, of different grocery store chains as to where they're going to open up their businesses. Successful treatment is gonna require attention to those structural factors, attention to the, uh, the social determinants of health and using anti-racism strategies um, to, um, as part of kind of the, the broader um, way that we think about um, health inequities, uh, particularly around these chronic diseases. And finally, we talk about, um, we use the phrase center at the margins, which um, has been used in critical race theory quite a bit. And really what we mean is that we need to shift our viewpoint from a majority group's perspective to that of the marginalized um, group or groups. And I think, I think on the surface, a lot of us who are committed to this cause are doing that in many ways, but I think we need to do more. Um, so that means diversifying our workforce, um, making sure that, the, that the, the places that the people we're serving, that they can see people in positions of power that look like them and represent them. Um, developing community-driven programs and research. That's why I'm so excited about this work with the, with the birth center. That work is driven directly from that birth center and the work that they're doing. It was their idea. Um, these ideas don't need to come from the academy. We've, we've created enough of that knowledge, but we need to be able to trust that the knowledge that, the knowledge that communities possess is, um, is, is what the real evidence is. Ensure that under-resourced people and communities gain positions of power. So we need to be able to look around the room and see, I would love to, I'm, I'm the only African-American faculty member in my department and one of two in the School of Public Health. I need to see more people that look like me in positions of power in the dean's office and in other roles. Um, we have a lot of work to do in that, in that respect. And then recognize whose narratives receive attention and voice. And that's something we're talking about a lot, um, at least in academia, and understanding that um, just because you have a PhD and can write a paper and get it published, that doesn't mean that um, what you say is, is the full, you know, is the full narrative and the full truth. We need to um, really start to consider um, other narratives um, and give those narratives voice. And then right now, I think more than ever, you know, given the events of November 8th, we need to really focus on creating fully inclusive, equitable, and safe organizations, groups, and, and other spaces. We need to work to make our com communities and places of work um, a safe haven where we feel empowered to show up as ourselves, as our true authentic selves um, within the work that we're doing. And we need spaces where everyone can rest in the knowledge that their importance, that their dignity, and their value as human beings is not questioned. So I would like to close um, by just saying that while these US election results um, they are what they are, they were terrible, they're devastating, they're frightening on many levels. But, um, you know, Harry Belafonte in his New York Times article also says, we changed it, many of us, through some of the proudest struggles of our history. It wasn't easy and sometimes it wasn't pretty, but we did it together. So I'm reminding myself that fight after fight, from one generation to the next, um, this work is our work and it will go on because we will go on, we have to find ways to collectively create a world in which we can all benefit from good health um, and well-being. And so while I don't feel like I have the answers right now, and I'm sure many of you are feeling the same way, and you know, our strategies may change moving forward, I don't know. I don't know what I might be talking about in the next three months. It might shift considerably given kind of the, the new climate that we're facing, but um, you know, I think Harry Belafonte's words remind us that we've done it before and we will do it again. Thank you. So uh, I get the privilege of having the first question. Great, sure. 
I, I did want to point out that it is a diverse group of folks in the room. And for those who don't know, the New England Journal of Medicine is one of the two premier medical journals in the entire country. And for NEMJ to be paying attention to this issue and bringing those words forward, it really has a landmark feel to it. Uh, and so I congratulate you. One of the phrases you used in there was, addressing violence against black communities can start with any racist practices in clinical care and research. And I wonder if you had any examples of successes in that area where kind of doing something with the intervention that's anti-racist in one of those two settings made a big difference? Yeah, I think we, I don't have any specific exam examples because I think we still haven't, we haven't done that. Um, I think it's what we, we need to be doing. And I draw a lot in my work from critical race theory and, um, you know, which really focuses on dismantling these power, the power and privilege and the structures that have al al allocated privilege to, um, to certain groups and certain communities. And so, you know, part of the discussions that we have with um, healthcare professionals and researchers are around, um, are around just that, is setting that, setting that stage, helping people to understand those, those ideas and that that's very real. Um, and then, you know, being able to ask, even ask a patient, I have a colleague who is a general internal um, medicine physician, and she is working to figure out ways to ask her patients um, how, how um, for instance, uh, Philando Castile being shot on July 7th by police in their community is impacting their health and well-being on that day as they walk into the, um, to the clinic. And so, you know, even, practicing kind of a, a level of empathy that I think um, is beyond what we've traditionally done within healthcare settings at least um, is really important and a really important piece of that. Thanks. Um, Maggie Fraser at the front here actually has a microphone and if you hold up your hand and as does Julian at the back, if you hold up your hand we'll get you the microphone. So while people are forming, oh, there's one there. Dr. Hardiman, I, I, I think I just want to start by saying thank you. Um, I think that you spoke words in ways that aren't often spoken, and it was courageous, especially given the climate of the time. Thank you. It, my question is, um, when you think about healthcare organizations, whether they're delivering medical or primary care or behavioral health, what do you think? Would you talk to us about what policies you think are critical to be part of the fabric of organizations mm -hmm. in such a way that they support you know, the kinds of delivery of equitable care that you talk about? Yeah, so thank you. That's a really great question. Can you all hear me? Oh, there we go. Um, so. I um, sit on the Mission Effectiveness Board for our, um, for our county hospital in, um, in the Twin Cities area, and that serves probably the largest, has the largest uh, percentage of patients of color and low-income patients in the, in the state. And, you know, one of the things that we discuss a lot and um, have focused a lot of efforts on um, is the, you know, one of the things I mentioned in one of my last slides around diversifying the workforce. So recruiting, recruiting, um, physicians uh, physicians from marginalized communities has been kind of a, a value and a strategy that they have committed um, committed to quite a bit and you know it's a long process because I mean really if you want to do that well you have to start way before people are in medical school you know we're talking we need to start at pre-k and um, kindergarten and um, and start and start there to really do that effectively and so they're trying to figure out their role as a as a county hospital in um, in doing that uh, which is not you know easy and some would argue is outside of the scope of what kind of a hospital should be should be doing um, but I think you know the more the more healthcare systems, the more organizations that are thinking in that way and thinking um, beyond healthcare um, to the social factors and the social determinants that we hear so much about is a really important part of that. Um, I also think that 
that, um, you know, looking at policy, you know, so policy with little p policy, right, within a, within a healthcare system, within a public health organization, whatever it may be, is, is something that's really important. To, so to understand kind of, I think there's ways that um, we don't realize that the policies or the language we've used are not um, promoting what we think they are. Um, and I know that's something that the Department of Health um, is, is doing in Minnesota and, you know, using, you know, there's a lot of places using kind of health equity scorecards right now to kind of um, help them um, measure some of that. So those are the two things that I um, feel like are good places to start. I really appreciate uh, your research and the things that you shared today, but I have a question. Uh, is there any research that can help those in the communities with these disparities and inequities uh, to have a voice mm -hmm. and to be able to articulate what they're feeling and be able to understand some of the things that you shared today? Yeah, that's, I think that's a huge, huge part of it. And when I think about kind of those, um, you know, listening to people's narratives and considering or reconsidering what evidence we decide is real, um, is a huge part of what you just, you know, what you what you just mentioned. And, you know, off the top of my head, I don't know. I think it's right now it's individual people who are doing that work and creating those spaces, and I haven't seen any any kind of organizations or systems that are are promoting um, specifically promoting that, but I know um, you know, at least in, in academia, there's there's people like uh, Chandra Ford at UCLA and Kamara Jones, who's the um, the current president of the um, uh, association, or the APHA, the American Public Health Association, who are really um, committed to to that. And um, you know, I hope I hope it's a movement, and that um, that's what we're we're working towards. Thank you very much for your remarks. I'm Laura Gabay. I had a question about how, uh, because you're at the forefront of this, has there been any research done on the impact on health outcomes for people who then not only um, have access to food and so forth, but what you're talking about is a lot about racial justice and social mm -hmm. justice. So uh, Carol Gilligan does some work around women um, from low-income backgrounds who get involved in community service or social justice. And it actually impacts the mental health outcomes mm -hmm. um, on a very measurable basis. Yeah. Have you seen this elsewhere in the country? Because we're looking at this. I work for the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition, okay. and we work with many people who have very fragile health, and yet when they get involved as social advocates or social justice advocates, we think that it's impacting not just their mental health, but perhaps their um, attention to preventive care and so forth. Yeah, I haven't seen any research on that. It's actually something that's kind of been brewing in the back of my ha uh, my mind around, uh, particularly around um, birth outcomes in the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so I um, have, will be starting a literature review on that soon, but I don't know of anything off the top of my head. I don't know if anyone in the audience does. Um, I'm looking at Megan, but <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. There, there is some some, I don't know how closely it's related, and it's not necessarily in the disabled community, but a lot of the research going uh, around the Gulf states after uh, Deepwater Horizon, after Katrina, and kind of repeated traumas to the community, have recognized that some communities bounce back quicker than others, right? Mm -hmm. So they're all subsistence kind of living based on seafood and fishing along the Gulf. And, and then trying to figure out those determinants that make one community bounce back and the other to define the world as the new normal. And what it seems to be is a sense of belonging, community, and community cohesion that we think translates to resilience. So trying to figure out how to measure those items of belonging and community support is where the research world is kind of trying to focus right now. And there's three different academic institutions along the Gulf who are taking the penalty money and trying to figure that out. And I will add that there, there's some work around um, kind of the idea of belonging and racial identity. Um, 
And you know, there's sociologists have done some work on that and found that um, you know it, it contributes to resiliency. And um, um, so I actually a couple years ago, um, I'm, par I'm part of a research team that looks at the experiences of um, medical students. And so we've been tracking the same students um, over five or just under 5,000 students since 2010, and they're now second year residents. And my particular interest has been in the um, experiences of underrepresented minority students in our sample. And one of the things that I've looked pretty closely at is the impact of racial identity. So having a strong self-concept and believing um, very strongly that um, around, you know, the endorsing ideas around kind of being what it means to be African American or black and what that means to them. Um, and we went in with the hypothesis that it would be protective, that. Um, that um, that be having a strong or a positive racial identity would um, result in kind of more um, or better well-being or me mental well-being in particular, and found that that wasn't the case. That students who had a very um, strong self-identity as African American were actually suffering more. And so we started looking at belonging um, and um, how they describe how they f you know include feelings of inclusiveness and belonging within um, medical school and. Uh, it's directly, it's directly related in those spaces, I think, and we're hoping to do some qualitative work to dig into this a little more, but it seems that um, in these spaces that are so, where they are very, very much part of the minority and um, both in the racial climate, so other work I've done has looked at the fact that um, a negative racial climate or diversity climate in these schools, so it's 50 medical schools across the US, um, so a negative racial climate um, is impacting, is creating poor well-being for everyone, for the underrepresented minority students, students but for everyone. And um, so we're hoping to do some qualitative work to kind of dig into that more and understand why um, racial identity isn't protective and if it's related to this issue of belonging and inclusiveness. So, so hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, I appreciate your words and your comments. I, I too am one of the only, <laughs> not one of, but the only um, faculty of color within my department. And so I get the isolation and the degree of invisibility. Yeah. But the question that I have for you is that I feel like it's a statement and a question all in one because I think it's a double-edged thing. Sure. So there's this, this push for the academy to diversify. Yep. And then when we show up, we're not really welcome yeah. to receive because there's yeah. this degree of perceived incompetence, right? So I'm constantly trying to prove that my research and my presence is just as valuable as my, my white yeah. colleagues, yet when we show up, it sort of lets people off the hook. So my yeah. question to you is how do you do both in? How do you color up the workforce, but yet have everyone still know that this is a collective responsibility, that just because I show up doesn't mean that no one else now is responsible yeah. for creating you know, a, a diverse environment that fosters inclusion? Yeah, I think that's a huge, huge issue, and thank you for raising it. Um, I do not have the answers to that. I think it's something that, um, you know, in my in my department, um, you know, for, well, I would say first, you know, we need allies, and you know, creating kind of a. I've I've been fortunate enough to um, create a strong group of allies and people who um, aren't going to let this these issues drop and like let you know, let people off the hook and saying they check the box because we have, uh, you know, two faculty of color or whatever it may be. So I think that's an important, and these allies can't be other people of color, right? They have to be, um, you know, white allies or people who, um, you know, are identify with the majority in some way. Um, I think that's, a, that's an important part of it. I, <laughs> I would love to hear if anyone else has any thoughts, any strategies on that because I think it's, you know, retention is, is a huge piece of it. So if you don't feel like, you know, they got you there, but then if you don't feel like you are welcome or um, included in, in some way, then, you know, there's no incentive to stay. I don't, I don't have a question. I, uh, I wanted to kind of bear testimony and echo some of what you were saying, Dr. Hardiman. Uh, and I think these words are as much for me right now as they are for anyone else. Mm -hmm. But clearly it is, uh, it is very easy to, to lose hope right now, to, to lose heart, and you alluded to that. Uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, he's a writer for The Atlantic, and he wrote uh, Between the World and Me, mm -hmm. 
which is a, a masterpiece on uh, the experience of being black in America. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this. But uh, I listened to him speak once, and he stated that the only charge he hears, or the only critique he has against his work, is not a uh, refutation of any of the facts, because those are irrefutable. What he hears is, well, that doesn't feel very good. Right. Well, that's, that's uncomfortable. Right. Or where's the hope in that? And I heard him give a response, and it's, it stayed with me. And he said that if you were born in the early to mid 1700s, black in the South, you could look back 100 plus years into the life of your parents, the lives of your grandparents, and you would see nothing but slavery and bondage. And you could look forward 100 plus years into the lives of your children and your grandchildren and see nothing but slavery and bondage. Where's the hope in that? And I think that hope is, is crucial, and it can serve as a, a catalyst for our work, but our work is bigger than hope, or even the desired outcomes that that hope is attached to. Right? Those outcomes are often beyond our control. Ultimately, we do this work because it is right, yeah. and because we must, to lay the foundation for those who will inevitably come after us to continue our struggle at a higher elevation and to serve uh, and honor the legacy of those who came before us 50 years ago, 100 years ago, two, 300 years ago, many of whom never lived to see the world that they were trying to construct and create, uh, the world that we live in today. We have a long way to go, but we have come very, very far. And there's always been tyranny and oppression but there have always been liberators. And here we are. And here we are. Thank you. I'm going to take this pause. Oh, I just have a ahead. quick question. Sorry. Um, sorry, I couldn't see you back there. Um, so I work for an organization that has an equity team. Uh, and I feel really thankful that we can have those conversations. But in light of you know recent events and the news we got yesterday, I found that I'm pretty tired being like one mm -hmm. of two people of color in the room, um, having the conversation of equity. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, like, what are some things that you do for sustainability, and how do you separate that, I don't know, in your personal life? Because I'm finding some of the struggles that I'm having are in my personal life as well with family members. So what are some things that you do outside of work and just on your own to kind of sustain that work? Thanks. So I think that's a really good question for the whole audience, right? I mean, we. I mean, I, I am certainly not the expert on, on, on that, um, you know, because it's, it's a struggle, right? It's, it's con you know, it's a constant back and forth. And, um, you know, I, I personally have trouble separating kind of the, the personal, the family life and, the, <laughs> and the, the work conversations because it's all, it's all intertwined and you can't, I, and part of me feels like you can't really separate it. Um, but I would love to know if there's anyone that has any kind of insight on that um, who's sitting in this room. And it looks like there is. I'll offer this. Hi, my name is Carol. I'm from Global Minded. And uh, I have a, a husband who works for a technology company. And as you know, many of the technology companies have 2% minority and women. And uh, one of their employees is this fabulous gentleman who's originally from Africa and does a great job. And, so my husband was on this leadership um, acceptance committee and rated him, you know, kind of off the charts for the fact that English is not his first language, he does a great job at work, all these reasons. But his boss's boss did not recommend him for this leadership class, so he did not have that buy-in. So my husband went to bat for this individual and got him into the leadership class. And part of what I think we need to put on the table here, here today is that we need people who are some of the Caucasian males, like my husband, who stand up and fight for and open the door for people of color. Yeah. I think really being able to see that in a broad way. The second thing is, we were talking about this earlier, we have people on our board like Patty Lopez from Intel, and she doesn't have a lot of other Latinas up at Intel and Fort Collins. So she has to build her network of support from a variety of other people women and, and, and other folks that support her through National Council of Women in Technology and through other networks. So 
I think where, you know, my case in my career, I was the first female assistant vice president. We have to build these coalitions of support from places sometimes other than where we're working. So those are my, my two takeaways is one, let's recruit some of the men who are willing to stand up to the people in power and fight for and open doors for diverse and LBGTQ and all kinds of other people who deserve access. And then let's ourselves realize that we can't always look to our place of work to be the place that inspires us and promotes us, but we have a number of amazing people in the communities around us and we can create those people and be the amazing people of strength to be breaking trail where we need to be going and doing that. Um, I'm Elise Montez Griego. I work with the Orton Family Foundation, and I love your question because I think we're all facing that in different networks that I belong in as well. And um, there's been a real conversation around self care um, because we can't always have our equity warrior hat on. There are times that we need to go home and be a peace warrior and a take care of myself warrior and you know some people have talked about whether you meditate or you just you know read a book like make sure you take time out to recharge because it is hard work and we do go and you know hit our head against a brick wall every day so yeah Dr. Hardiman I had a I had a question about advice about naming it and using the word racism. So um, th there are a number of us in the room that have been here for every health equity learning series event. And I, I love the, one of the comments that came out of our first convening of all the HELS, uh, H-E-L-S, the learning series, unfortunate acronym, uh, the learning series grantees and the, to, to paraphrase it was, okay, we get it, it's racism. Mm -hmm. How do we talk about that? And what they were expressing is that in their communities, the Eastern Plains, the Western Slope, as we dribble farther out from the metro area and we leave the, I would say, relative safety and comfort of audiences like this, mm -hmm there is a real fear and worry and a shutdown that happens with the word racism. And so I hear often, how do we talk about it? How do we bring that up? How do we broach the world? And, and then I will tell you, I'm, I'm willing to be wrong, but I think Colorado is a little farther behind, even Minnesota. Oh, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's like a, the million dollar question, right? Is um, you know, how do we have these conversations and how do we talk about this? One of the things I, um, you know, try and start with a lot, you know, depending on the audience is, you know, being clear that we're not talking about individual racist acts. You know, we're not talking about individual, per, you know, perpetrators because I think that's a lot of what, you know, people kind of shut down because they're like, you're calling, me, you're calling me racist. And it has nothing, that's not it at all. Um, in, in most, in most cases, um, that's not that's not what we're talking about. So making you know being clear about that from the outset, I think is is so important. Um, and when people can start to see that we're talking about systems um, and we're talking about structures that they may not have played a, a individual or specific role in creating, um, but are by being silent, you know are part of that. Um, I think that's that's the point I always hope to or try to get across. Um, I think it's, it's hard depending on where, you know, we were talking about this a little bit last night at dinner about kind of, you know, I've, I've been in classrooms or, you know, with students where people are starting at complete, a lot of different places in their understanding of, of this topic. And, um, you know, so starting at the beginning and starting with our history, and that's why, you know, in the New England Journal of Medicine piece too, we, the first thing we say is we have to know our history. And unfortunately, that history is not being taught in, um, in, in our schools in the way that it always should be. And so, um, you know, I, I taught a, I had a four-day course. So the, the, it was a public health institute course where, um, so they, students are around for four days, um, four to five hours a day, and so I had, you know, 16 hours to get from 
the history of white supremacy and, um, and structural racism to how it impacts health policy and health inequities. And it was really, really hard because there were some students who had no clue that it even was it was that it existed in any way and just kind of had accepted that, you know, they understood that there were disparities and had just accepted that as like, that's just, you know, we've always known that, um, you know, black folks, for instance, have um, worse health outcomes. And actually Mary Bassett, who's the commissioner of health for New York City um, 30 years ago, so <laughs> 30 years ago wrote, um, wrote a piece called The Health of Black Folks where she talked about the normalization of, um, of poor black health and kind of how we've, as a society, have accepted it as kind of the, the norm. And um, so that's part of kind of the, the tools that I use too, is to um, lay that out and say, you know, and people, because people will say, yeah, we know, you know, I know that they're more likely, black people are more likely to have heart disease or more like, you know, whatever the disparity is. But then, you know, so then I ask the question, so why, you know, what do you think is causing that? And a lot of times that opens up a conversation in a door that um, wouldn't otherwise have been open. So. Hi, I'm, I'm Paul Aldretti with, tri, uh, with uh, Mile High Connects. So we're, we're doing a lot more work around health and equity. Um, health specifically in term in kind of the social determinants of health around housing access to food uh good jobs and the impacts of those and becoming more increasingly involved with the healthcare industry and healthcare providers in uh, communities of color and low-income communities i think that what's happening in denver now in terms of displacement um in terms of gentrification in terms of how transit is exacerbating those issues in mm -hmm. terms of forcing people into new communities. Uh, and I've been doing a lot of thinking around segregation and how segregation exacerbates racism, essentially, and both overtly and covertly. And as this gentrification and displacement occurs, what we're essentially doing is I think concentrating poverty and forcing people to live in more segregated communities than they actually lived in before. Um, and so I think it's really challenging to the healthcare, healthcare providers and everyone who's in this room to think about how they engage in those conversations about racism as a byproduct of some of these things that are currently happening like gentrification and displacement. Um, that that health is, is, not an, can, is not only an outcome of those, but it can be a driver in how we think about being better about, and more, um, how do I want to say, more intentional mm -hmm. about addressing that on the front end. And so I guess my question, after all of that, my question is really how can, how can the healthcare industry or healthcare providers, I'm not sure exactly, what you call yourselves, um, be more intentional about stepping up to the front on those issues? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. I think a one that a lot of healthcare systems are grappling with right now. Um, there's a community clinic in the Twin Cities in Minneapolis that's linked to the, the hospital I mentioned um, previously that is actually, I think is doing some really interesting work around this. So they've, like, they've embedded, for instance, a lawyer in their clinic. Yeah, so there's, um, you know, on certain days of the week, um, you can go see your physician for whatever those, you know, healthcare needs are. But then if the physician, you know, in that interaction re realizes that, you know, you, you know, the, I think one of the, the examples that they qu use quite often is a patient who's dealing with housing issues and is going to be evicted for whatever reason, um, you know, right, they, they're able to go, you know, down the hall and talk to someone who has the legal expertise to help them deal with that because it is connected that you know all of those social factors are connected to our health in some way um, you know there's I think there's some folks at Yale who are um, doing some work around this particularly with the homeless population because they 
we're dealing with, which a lot of cities and counties deal with, um, you know, the homeless population being checked into the hospital or the ER for one reason or another, and then not having any place to, um, you know, to send them once they are they are well. And so, figuring out what the hospital or the healthcare system's role is in making sure that um, there's a, a link or a connection between a county hospital and, um, you know transitional housing or even a respite center that um, can provide um, you know some kind of um, temporary housing or care for for patients so there's you know I think we as meaning kind of the healthcare healthcare system and healthcare professionals are thinking about those things a lot more um, and you know in some cases are trying to get those structures and systems into place to be able to um, more effectively serve the whole person and rather rather than just one kind of component but we have a long ways to go in, in doing that and I think there's a lot of models outside of the US um, too that we can look to that are um, that are doing that quite well so um been a great dialogue and discussion today, and I want to thank Dr. Hardiman again for joining us. I'm going to have to have us wrap up. Um, I, I, I tried to start with a very positive message of hope, and it, it came from, first of all, I really do believe that opportunities will be presented. We've now managed to open the whole wound, right? And so there's nothing hidden left. Uh, and that's an important part to start healing. Um, I talked to my daughter last night. I reached out. It, there, so you'll know probably what side of the aisle I might be on, but I felt the sense of that kind of natural disaster feel that makes you want to reach out to your family. And uh, I called her, and she was in tears. And <clears throat> she works in healthcare, uh, in Medicare quality assurance. She's I think a little bit of afraid for a job, certainly afraid for her clientele, and just so deeply saddened by the outcomes of the election. And um, it, was, it was hard to hear, and as you parents know, listening to a child in pain is just very, very hard. And I realized that it really becomes my role in that setting to provide hope. I have to tell you something that she said that really got to me. She said, it's okay, Dad. I need to wallow in this for about another day. And then I need to get to work. And so I'm telling you, I understand the wallowing and uh, sharing and the need to take care of ourselves. And I know that everyone is watching how we respond. So. I hope you can respond with that sense of hope moving forward and healing that I think we're just going to have to have for this country to start moving back on the right track. And I think this is a room full of people that can do that. So I really appreciate you being here today. We'll post the slides from the presentation early next week at coloradotrust.org and the video recording probably a week or two after that. You can sign up through our website to stay informed about future uh, events via email. The next learning series will be held on February 28th next year, fe featuring Lydia X. Brown. And please check our website for where. I want you to help us to make sure you take minutes to fill out the brief survey when it comes to you in email. Share your thoughts and help us make this series better. And then finally, these are really a team effort. I have to thank the entire Colorado Trust staff for their assistance. I want to recognize Maggie Frazier for overseeing so much of the event today. And I want to thank uh, the staff at Coffee at the Point and, of course, our friends at Op Open Media Foundation for everything they do to make this day possible. Thanks for being here.